Oh. It's just about three o'clock. And we are recording right now. Great. Well, welcome everyone to the second, second district planning committee meeting. Um, it is March 30th, 2021, and we are via Zoom. So I just wanted to um, read again the purpose um, and the goals of the district planning committee. So the purpose of the district planning committee will be to develop and recommend to the Cape Elizabeth School Board a plan or plans to return our students to in-school learning while honoring the following three goals, safety of students and staff, student learning, assessment and equity, and social and emotional well-being of students and staff. So I just wanted to, to say that we'll be taking questions and comments during this meeting just from the committee members. So if people are watching um, or listening and you have comments or questions, please just jot them down and you, they may be answered during this um, information you get from today's meeting. But if they're not, then at the end, if you could just put them in the chat and or email them to me and then I'll answer them in the uh, frequently asked questions section on our website. So um, the, next, the, the next school board meeting is on April 13th. And hopefully this committee will have a recommendation to bring to the board at that meeting. So that's going to be our goal moving forward is that we are ready um, with, with a recommendation by the April 13th school board meeting. And we have two more meetings um, after this one. So um, I, I'm confident that we will be ready with that. The administrative team has continued to work on some options which we think are feasible. And um, we had a meeting today again and um, talked about, can we do this? And we have, we have some good ideas and we'll talk about those later. But really this meeting is going to focus more largely on the risks and benefits of bringing more students back into our building. It's important to listen to and understand these risks and benefits and to weigh them carefully. And um, I did have an email from um, a community member this morning um, and she talked about you, us just continually making excuses for why we couldn't get our students back in school. And I do wanna say that concerns about safety are not excuses, but we need to take them really seriously. So I know we're going to get some really uh, important information today um, and we will certainly take that information seriously. Some changes since our March 16th meeting. Uh, social distancing guidelines from the federal CDC changed from three feet to six feet for elementary students, as long as everyone is wearing a mask. It's still six feet for eating. And in the middle school and high school and communities where transmission is high, the CDC advises students to stay six feet apart if cohorting is not possible. Uh, our staff continue to be vaccinated and 80, uh, the recent survey we did, 87% of those that responded said that they expected to be vaccinated by the end of April. On Wednesday, March 24th, parents and community members worked to move desks, um, chairs and tables out of storage and to help wash them down. So we're really thankful to those people that came out to help. So this week, the custodians are moving some of the furniture into the classroom and we're taking inventory of what's needed. Um, a few weeks ago, Troy and Jace had submitted orders for some furniture and they're working on another order right now. So that is happening um, right now, getting our furniture situation uh, in line. So last, at our last meeting, um, there was some information that was requested about COVID testing in our schools and our nurses have agreed to um, talk a little bit about that. So I'm gonna hand this over to, I'm not, I think Karen's talking. I'm not sure which one of them is talking, but. Um, John, I was just gonna do a quick update. Oh, Aaron, Aaron's doing it, yes, Aaron's yep. doing it. So the Cape Elizabeth School Department, we applied for and received a CLIA waiver in December to be able to conduct, um, we have the Binax Now testing kits in the school, and those are to be used for symptomatic students or staff who develop COVID-like symptoms while at school. Um, so the purpose of the testing at school is simply for symptomatic individuals and is not intended for any routine screenings on student or staff. Um, however, should the district be presented with a confirmed 
COVID-19 case in one of our schools that results in multiple staff members having to be um, who are identified as close contacts and have not completed their vaccination series yet, then um, the district could use the test kits for serial testing of the asymptomatic staff if we did not have sub coverage available for that particular staff member. Um, but that would be done on a case by case basis. And um, with any reporting or any testing that we do resulting either positive, negative, or an inconclusive uh, results, all of that information gets reported to the CDC with an online electronic portal. So Aaron, have we used this testing? We have, yep, yep. for both um, staff and students. Great. Any questions um, from our panelists about that? Okay, thanks for that information, Erin. We have uh, two presentations today. Um, the first one, and, and these really are going to largely focus on risks and benefits um, to bringing more students into our schools. The first one, um, Dr. Jessica Rosenthal, who is a pediatrician and a parent, and Dr. Smita Santi, our district physician, are, they have um, worked together for this presentation. So take it away. Thank you, Donna. Jessica is going to kindly um, uh, share a screen to project some slides. Um, I just want to introduce myself briefly. Um, I think I know some of you. I'm the school district physician. I've worked with the school district for the past seven years. Um, and up till now was relatively uh, routine um, until this year. Um, so um, I also am, I work at Martins Point Healthcare as, as a family physician and the practice medical director there and have been involved in, in many efforts there in the past year with our COVID response. And I have a, a background before medical school in public health, um, I trained, trained in that. So um, Jessica and I have tried to, um, I think what, what the best way to, to describe these slides is really not exhaustive, but just a sort of a medical or clinical perspective by which we can have um, decisions be informed by the data. And um, again, it isn't really answering any questions about what the school district should do. It really is informing um, your decision and our decision. There are lots of other operational questions regarding safety and how to, um, how to do that as a, as a community. This is really just one piece to, to inform us. So um, with that said, Jessica, if you are able to share a slide or two. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, so that's us and that's what our, our goal is today. And um, we compiled some of this, but it is not exhaustive. So um, certainly if there's other information that comes to light or, or that anyone else has to share, feel free to um, provide that in the coming days or weeks. Uh, next slide. Yep. Thank you. So they would I mean, sorry, if my internet is not great, someone feel free to tell me and I can move. It's a little spotty sometimes. <laughs> I'll say next or something, Jessica. Okay. Thank you. Um, so these are just some brief objectives. We just wanted to review some of the data on our current local prevalence um, and that's sort of changing day to day. So Jessica tried to pull up the most recent from the past day or two um, and then review the updated CEC guidelines. We're all relatively familiar with that, but just a, a little um, peek at it again to really understand um, the words behind it and also um, where it came from. And we'll talk about a few studies. Um, there have been several, but just tried to pick a few um, to dive into a little bit more to better understand um, the behind the scenes of those studies, specifically the Massachusetts one. And then some information on vaccine data and local data and also some transmission um, information among our, our adolescent and younger uh, age groups. And then just a sort of overview of the mental health impacts of, um, of where we are at today. So that's sort of a, a summary of what we'd like to cover as quickly as we can. <laughs> So um, the current rates, and we pulled this straight from the, the CDC um, data tracker that you all can certainly find as well, our seven-day positivity rate ranges somewhere between 2.5 and 2.8, um, and that makes us a 96 per 100,000 to 100 per 100,000, and it'll make more sense on the next slide what that means. Um, it really puts us in a, depending on which day it is, the high to substantial community transmission for our county. Um, and just another uh, perspective on that, which we'll go over on the other slide, this is different than what the main DOE is using for our green um, criteria. So I'll, I'll show that on the next slide. 
Um, just as another just point of information, we hear about sort of the rising rates in younger younger people and, and the rising rates in, um, in certain age ranges. And so just to put a little perspective on it, our 20 to 30 year olds are actually um, the, the great, greatest subgroup of um, cases, new cases with 18% and our less than 20 year olds are 16%. And then this, the others are sort of somewhat evenly distributed um, uh, the other age groups. So certainly there is a, a chunk that is our, our younger population. Thanks, Jess. Next slide. So um, this is sort of explains um, that where that prevalence information came from. If we're at 97 or 97 percent on one day to 100 percent in our county, we're somewhere between the orange and red, kind of depending on the day. Previously, we had been in, in the high for several weeks and only recently have been um, dropped into the orange for our county. And it sort of still depends on the day. Um, the DOE, as you all are much more familiar with, is using uh, a categoriz categorization of safety to, um, re to be in school or in person. And that is more than just prevalence data. It's a lot of other qualitative factors and infection control and mitigation factors that the school nurses are, are um, intimately familiar with. Um, and so that's why um, it's not just as simple as prevalence to guide the DOE criteria. Next slide. Um, so just to review, and Donna did just mention this, but this is an update since our last meeting. It was sort of known that this might come out because Dr. Fauci had made some statements the weekend before our previous meeting. But um, the CDC update now, their guidance is elementary school students should be spaced at least three feet apart. Middle and high school students should be spaced at least three feet apart in areas of low, moderate, or substantial community transmission. In areas of high community transmission, they should be spaced six feet apart if cohorting is not possible. So this is where the um, previous slide um, that we were just looking at is relevant. Um, there are still cases where, um, where the six feet recommendation is still in place, and that's between adults in the school building, between adults and students. And this is because of several studies that have found that transmission between staff is more common than transmission between students and staff or among students in schools. Six feet spacing is still needed when masks can't be worn, such as with eating, and during activities when there's increased exhalation, like singing and sports and exercise, those should be ideally done outside. Um, and this, so the three foot spacing is now consistent with the main DOE spacing guidelines that have been in place, as well as the World Health Organization guidelines. So just in terms of some, something that we wanted to specifically address, in terms of like the CDC's definition of a close contact, there's, they still define that as being within six feet of an infected person with or without a face mask for at least 15 minutes cumulatively in a day. So they didn't change that guidance um, with the new recommendation of three foot spacing um, in some cases in schools, but they also didn't, address, you know, there is no um, statement that there's an increased risk from transient passing within three feet. The main DOE has a different sort of way that they go about um, managing close contacts. They quarantine an entire classroom um, when there's a contact in that classroom. So they don't use the three, the six foot um, definition, but they do put on their website to help protect students in the school and out of, a, of an abundance of caution, Maine CDC considers everyone within a classroom to be close contacts and other states don't follow this. So, you know, I don't know if this is something that the state is, is thinking about changing as these guidelines change. Um, just to go over why um, the spring, why is why are things sort of different now than what the spring 2020 school guidance was? Because I think this is part of why um, this has just been so sort of difficult to adapt to or to at least wrap our heads around. So in terms of the decision to close schools in March, that was based on data from influenza transmission for which schools and children are often a major driver of influenza pandemics. Um, now data shows that with the SARS-CoV-2, so the virus that causes COVID-19, transmission in schools is limited when mitigation measures are used and that children in schools are not the primary drivers of the pandemic. So this is what allowed schools to begin the reopening process. In terms of the six foot physical distancing guidance, that was based on historical studies of other contagious diseases like the 1982 bacterial meningitis outbreak and the SARS-CoV-1, which is what we sort of call SARS um, in a hospital setting. So the more emerging international and US data suggests that the layering of other prevention strategies is effective at reducing SARS-CoV-2 transmission, even with physical distancing of less than six feet between students and classrooms. And this second bullet comes straight from the CDC. This is, was part of their um, update when they released the new guidance. 
So um, the, the CDC guidelines that have changed in March were informed by lots of recent studies. Um, in more, the specific one um, that we've all heard about is the Harvard study in Massachusetts. And so it is worth spending just a few, few seconds just reviewing what the, the, um, this study and sort of what, what it was about, because I think it really is helpful to dive into it a little bit and understand that it was quite a large uh, population, as you can see, 251 school districts, um, half a million students and 100,000 staff. Um, over a 16 week period of uh, note that it did include K through 12. So there were high schools, um, middle schools involved in this. And um, the bottom line conclusion that you may have all sort of read about and heard about is that the number of cases of, among students and staff were similar in schools that had three feet and schools that had six feet. Um, uh, next slide, Jess. So just to uh, go a little bit more deeply into what, what that means is, there was enough of a sample size there that really these results do have a, a pretty a profound ap application to lots of different scenarios. Um, it didn't separate by school type like uh, elementary school, middle school, or high school, but most school districts use the same mitigation efforts for all schools. So generally masking, generally um, uh, you know symptom screening, that sort of thing, were all in, in the same school. So um, in that sense, you can sort of extrapolate from, from all schools to some degree. Importantly, um, it did have some controlling for community prevalence and demographic variables. And this is important because we'll see a theme in, in that some of the, the rates when they are higher in schools, they are often higher in, in the surrounding community um, first. So um, this sort of controlled a little bit for that. It took, it took out some of the, the counties or air school districts where there were really, really high rates um, for certain reasons. Um, and it also took out some schools and it, that's in the bullet below that had surveillance testing, which which would indicate potentially that those schools had some extra measures. Um, and so it so took some of those out. So we have some very similar um, uh, controls there that made it a very, a very strong study. Uh, in addition, if you look at some of the infection control efforts, um, there were a lot of slightly different variations. Some schools had, you know, older school buildings that had certain ventilation processes and some were newer. Some had mandatory symptom screening by an app. Some had them by, um, by honor system. And so there are all sorts of slight variabilities as you can imagine. And I know this question has come up in sort of what the real world application is of our infection control policy. And when you get to a, a population this big, it sort of, it would include a, a lots of those different um, variables and sort of uh, address all those. So in, in that sense, this um, study was pretty, pretty robust in many ways. And it did correlate between community rates, so rates in the community and positive cases in particular among the school staff. So um, in that sense, it supports other studies we've seen. Next slide, Jess. Thanks. So I'm not gonna go into all the, the um, in the weeds here. If anyone's interested in this, um, some of them are, are certainly interesting, but to review in detail, just a, a couple highlights. These were all studies um, from pretty large groups of um, school districts, the New York City public schools. Um, and, I, and I chose this one just to note that this was an urban school district that had potentially certain, you know, closer contact in, in those smaller schools or um, those, small, those buildings. And the pro prevalence was no higher than in the general community and transmission within the schools was not um, common. In the North Carolina study, what I wanted to highlight was really um, that this was again, a large, large um, population that they studied, but there were no instances in this of child to adult transmission. Um, also uh, important to note that um, there were 773 community acquired SARS COVID infections in this study. And if the transmission in schools was similar to what the community transmission would have been, you would have had about 900 cases of um, infection in the schools and you, we only had 32. So it really shows that the school mitigation efforts were really quite strong to, to prevent that transmission. Um, Next slide. And um, this is a, a white paper that if anyone wants to read, really also pretty fascinating. Um, and what this supports is that really, um, if the community transmission was the same across uh, the board, that the school rates of transmission did not increase within person learning. Um, and that there was one area in this case where there was a really, really high community prevalence that the in-person learning had slightly higher rates than remote, um, which 
would certainly make sense. And then just a summary of all that, um, the CDC review of prevalence in schools, and this is straight from the CDC website that um, the COVID rates were similar in counties. So these are just more generalizations with in-personal education versus remote. Um, so just to kind of go over some general um, takeaways um, in terms of differences by age and transmission and severity of COVID, um, in the zero to 24 year old age group, the incidence of COVID does generally increase with age, but is still lower than older age groups. Um, and 18 to 24 year olds had higher incidence than other age groups. So um, there is, there are increased um, cases. So for example, like the zero to four group tends to be lower than the five to 10 as compared to the middle school age and then the high school age. Um, Underlying conditions, regardless of age though, were the biggest predictor of severe outcomes in children. Um, and just as Smita just said, there are several studies on school-based transmission that do include the whole range of ages. So from K through 12. Um, and sorry, one thing I just added was, um, cause I happened to catch Dr. Shah's press conference just before this, he noted again currently that um, 20 to 30 year olds are driving more of the new cases than other young people. So then other, um, including like the zero to 20 year old age group. Oops, sorry. Um, so just to go over again, how much protection vaccines provide because this is sort of some of the very exciting news these days with COVID. Um, so the Pfizer vaccine, which is one of the mRNA vaccines, is 95% effective in preventing COVID after two doses, according to the CDC, and that's from their like original trials. Um, there was an Israeli trial that was done on the Pfizer vaccine, and it was done during the third COVID wave there, which included the UK variant um, as one of the, that was the prevalent variant in Israel at the time, which is one of the sort of newer variants that people have been concerned about. And um, so even with that, after two doses, um, so full vaccination, the Pfizer vaccine reduced symptomatic cases by 94%, hospitalization by 87%, and severe COVID by 92%. And um, even two to three weeks after the first dose, there was still a significant amount of protection, um, which I'll, I can go into a little bit in a newer um, study that just came out. Moderna, which is also an mRNA vaccine and has been shown to be very similar um, as compared to Pfizer, was 94.1% effective in preventing COVID after the full two dose series, um, according to the CDC. And then the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, which where the trials were done at a slightly different time. And so um, maybe we're sort of up against more like more difficult, um, had a more difficult task in terms of providing protection. Um, there's J and J is still 66% effective in preventing COVID after um, the first dose, two weeks after the first dose, which is full protection with that vaccine had high efficacy of preventing hospitalization and death in people with COVID. And there were no hospitalizations four weeks after people had received the J&J &J vaccine. Um, a new CDC study that just came out yesterday shows like in the real world, so um, not during the clinical trials, but actually in people that have been vaccinated and are just going about sort of their regular lives. Um, two weeks after the second dose of both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, risk of infection with COVID decreased by 90%. And even two weeks after the first dose, risk of infection decreased by 80%. So this sort of shows the real life um, utility of these vaccines. And um, trials in children are cu currently in progress. Um, Moderna is testing down to six months. Pfizer plans to test down to six months. I don't know if the trials have actually started. And J&J &J has said they'll be testing um, down to even infants. So the movement is happening, but in terms of when vaccines will actually be available for children, other than the 16 year olds who are already eligible for Pfizer, um, that is not clear at this time. And just in terms of our state and local vaccine rates, so 30% um, of Maine residents have had their first dose, 19% have had their final dose. So that's either the second of Pfizer and Moderna or the first of J&J. 33% of Cumberland residents have had their first dose and 22% with the final dose. Um, more than 75% of all residents, 70 of older, are vaccinated, which is great because they're at highest risk of health complications. Um, there aren't any published data on um, school staff vaccine rates at this time. I don't know if anyone in the school systems has any other information about that. And Donna mentioned this, but based on the staff survey, 87% of staff said they plan to be vaccinated by the end of April. Um, just to oops, sorry, just to speak to the fact that all of these school considerations um, 
they're not happening in a vacuum. So there's, you know, kids, adolescents, everyone, adults also are dealing with the effects of COVID. And in terms of um, the impacts on kids, school is a significant part, um, but there are the mental health aspects goes beyond just school. Um, there was just a COVID experiences nationwide survey that was published, um, I think within the last week. And, um, I, you know, interestingly, in comparison to children who were attending in person school, so they stratified by fully in person, what they called combined, which was our the hybrid model or virtual, which was um, the remote school option. Children um, who attended in person, sorry, in, compar in comparison to children who were in person, the combined or the virtual school, um, children's mental health or emotional health worsened during the pandemic. They had less time outside, less time in person with friends and had less physical activity. Um, and parents in that group more frequently reported their own emotional distress, difficulty sleeping, loss of work, concern about job stability, childcare, conflict between work and providing childcare. So, you know, this is taking a toll. The, the, the physical part is clearly a concern, but for kids, I think the mental health aspects are generally more of a concern. Um, unrelated to school type, but just to go over this in general, because I think it's important. Compared with 2019, the proportion of mental health related emergency room visits for children aged 5 to 11 and 12 to 17 increased 24 and 31% respectively um, in the following year. And um, there's been an increase in suicidal thoughts and attempts. Um, a study in Texas showed that recent suicidal ideation was 1.6 and 1.45 times higher in March and July of 2020 compared to the previous year. So just to summarize, um, tried to take a, couple, a few elements of really key, key questions that people have had um, and, and address it, but ultimately um, uh, the key takeaways we'd like to, to share are that community rates can impact our schools and should certainly inform that, but that within school transmission is low. Um, adolescent rates tend to be higher than younger rates, younger children and um, still lo lower than adults. And that may inform our decisions as well as, for, as far as um, particular school decisions. Um, and also the, the Massachusetts study it is a, a pretty good sample and a, a variety of districts and, and patterns of infection control. So that is um, certainly robust. Um, one thing to note is that these studies were all done in mostly pre-vaccinated populations. And so we certainly may have a very, very different um, experience in the coming months uh, in a good way, in a positive way. Um, and just hope to, to share that this, these slides just inform our decisions. They don't answer all the questions or all the hows or all the whens um, of how this could be, but just hopefully provides a, a platform or perspective for us to, to discuss further. Um, and to summarize, and this is from the CDC, this is also from the DOE, that the schools that have had in-person learning with low rates, they've utilized all these, um, these practices that, that our school district is using um, in, in various ways. And so that should certainly be our foundation. Great. Gosh, thank you, Jess and Sunita. That was great. What a lot of information. Are there any questions from our panelists? I was gonna wait until after the nurses did those, but I think there was so much information there that if anybody has questions now um, specific to that information, uh, if you can raise your hand, use your the raise hand feature. Oh, when? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask um, with the studies, uh, you talked a lot about mitigation, you know, mitigation strategies and one of them being distancing. Do you know if these schools were, um, whether they were full in ter terms of student population, whether everyone was in school? So is that is that how all of those worked? Just, just wanted to know. That's a great question. Um, I can certainly come on in at least one of them where they actually stratified by having uh, the data being 25% full, 50% full, and 75% full um, at various rates. And so the data is, is you would imagine that the more in school they are, the more students there are, there's slightly increased rates, but they were, they were pretty close. Um, so one of the studies did do that. I'm not sure about the other two. Um, and just to add, there are, I actually, I've read a lot of studies, so I, I can try to find the particulars, but um, there were like definitely a number of studies where actually, um, students who were spending more time in school, there were lower rates of transmission among the students spending more time in school as compared to students who had less time in school. 
Um, and there's a lot of discussion about that where that there's much more transmission among kids outside of school than there is inside and the kids are mixing outside of school. Um, I, can, I can definitely try to get, if you wanna see any of the particulars, I can try to find some of the studies where that occurred. Great, thanks. Jeff? Oh, you're muted, Jeff. <laughs> Thanks for putting this together. That was a lot of work. I just, um, the slides were, came at me in a different order than, that didn't allow me to catch this quickly enough. But my understanding is under the, I think it was the US CDC guidelines, they're talking about if, if the rate of transmission is either substantially, substantial or high, that middle school and high school should have six foot distancing but I think it was the slide before that made it sound like we're going back and forth between substantial and high. Can you just clarify that for me? Did I understand that correctly? Because it could... Yeah, so this, the US CDC, so they have their four tiered system and it's like low, moderate, substantial and high. So the first three tiers, so low, moderate and substantial um, are sort of in one category in that respect. And then high is different. And you're right that for the high category, they state that for middle school and high school, um, if it's in high transmission, six feet of distancing should be maintained if cohorting is not possible. Um, so, so in the substantial category, that is not the case. Based on that recommendation, we can pull it up again if, we, if it helps. But for the high transmission, that is the case. And you're right, we are bouncing around. I looked this data up you know, three times in the last three days. And even depending on like the time of day that I looked, we're swinging back and forth between the substantial and the high zone. Basically it's based on our, um, based on our positivity data, we're in the lowest transmission category, but based on our case, new cases per 100,000, we are in the substantial or the high category. And we have to, in the way the CDC classification works, you have to take the more conservative number. So our positivity rate puts us in the low category, but that's, that doesn't matter if the other category is higher, which it is. Thanks. Uh, Matia, if you're next. Thank you. And I wanted to thank um, Jessica and Smita for an excellent um, presentation. That was very comprehensive. Um, <clears throat> so I uh, also wanted to, um, I wanted to um, point out um, that uh, in fact, the, the um, case, that, that metric you were just discussing, the um, new case, uh, case rate for the last seven days has been high really for the last um, few months, in fact. And it's really uh, just in the last couple, you know, week to two weeks that, ha that it has been um, bouncing between um, high and substantial. Um, <clears throat> So we're really just really getting to the point where um, we're seeing um, rates just below the threshold for high. Mm, uh, and, um, uh, but, you know, um, but really um, have community uh, case rates that are, that are still, you know, um, often very high. Um, and um, just regarding the uh, study that you went into depth, um, uh, on the study from uh, Boston, Har you know, Harvard and the uh, Massachusetts VA. I did wanna discuss that um, that study, like many other studies, um, does have some severe limitations. Um, and uh, one of which is that uh, you mentioned that it, um, the, that, uh, the, that it compared schools that observed three feet uh, physical distancing to schools that observed six feet physical physical distancing, but in fact, it did not. Um, it, it just separated schools. It just, it compared schools that had policies of three feet physical distancing or greater and compared them to schools that had poli uh, policies of six feet or greater physical distancing, um, but did not in fact um, compare the um, schools, uh, the implementation of those policies. So, um, the limitation there is that um, the lack of observed um, differences in the results may in fact be due largely to the fact that there um, may have been no difference in the implementation of those policies. And that is something that we do in fact have to consider. Um, and 
that is just one study. Um, and that is the main study that we have so far that we have been pointing to as far as um, school districts that have, um, or studies that have compared the difference between, um, you know, policies or, you know, of, of schools that have, you know, differences in uh, um, physical distancing. So that is the main study right now that we have. Um, and uh, also like you did note, um, uh, it did not um, get to examine um, uh, different age groups uh, or, you know, middle school children, middle school and high school children versus um, elementary school children. And we do know that the, um, that the, you know, sort of transmission dynamics may be different in older school, uh, in older school children. Um, so that is something to consider and something that uh, is, is sort of underpinning the uh, CDC's recommendation, the difference in the CDC's recommendation um, with regards to the older children versus the younger children um, with, uh, in the presence of uh, higher uh, transmission in the community, which is uh, in so much as to say, when the transmission is high, um, they still recommend either cohorting um, or six foot distance. Um, so that is something <clears throat> I, I did want to note. Thank you for that. Uh, sorry, um, and just uh, another um, uh, another note is that um, the uh, other studies that we have that did um, discuss uh, that you pointed um, that I think you were referencing. Uh, that did <clears throat> so, uh, note that layered mitigation strategies did uh, sh uh, support um, that transmission could be limited in the school environment. Um, in fact, were um, uh, studies that uh, in, in environments in which six foot distance were often used or um, a severe restriction of a number of students in pods or bubbles. So the data that we're using uh, that um, that talk about, uh, that support the, these uh, measures of layered mitigation are, um, th are those in which uh, there, was, there were a restricted number of students in these um, pods or bubbles and, and or um, you know, physical distancing was more often than not six feet. So, um, so I did want to point that out that, um, that, that those are the data that we have that we're using to um, to talk about layered mitigation strategies. Um, so I would like to, um, I, do, I do also want to just say that um, the point is well made uh, by Jessica that, um, that the uh, students are more often, I, or just in general, the data does support that people are more often getting um, sick in the community. And so I think it may be our responsibility to educate our community in general that if we want to keep our schools open that vaccine, you know, the thing, uh, some of the things that we can do to do that is um, obviously, you know, vaccinate when it's your when we have when we all have our chance. Um, reduce indoor gatherings with um, people that are not in your household and avoid contact sports, um, which I think maybe you know uh, maybe does not have as much support. But there is a lot of data that show that um, sports where there is close contact. Um, even masked um, is a, a source of, um, you know, transmission risk. Thank you. Thank you, Zakia. Bree, yeah. I think next we're going to do Bree and Sonia, and then um, I think we'll go to our nurses. Gee, I don't know if I have time to respond to some of that for a sec or if we want to wait. Um, there, and, you know, Zakia makes a lot of great points. The Harvard study definitely was based on guidelines. And so we don't know actually exactly what's going on in the schools. Um, there have definitely been a lot of studies that have looked at three foot spacing because, because of the World Health Organization recommendation for three feet. A lot of international studies look at the three feet spacing and there's actually a great article that there just wasn't time to include everything but I'm happy to share. Um, I can put it, I don't know if I put it in the chat. I actually don't know if there is a chat on my end but anyway, I can, I can share it because there's a lot of, um, there is a lot of data that looks more at the three foot spacing and I think that is relevant. There are other state studies even going on now looking at like one foot spacing and other things just because we're still learning about this disease. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just one thing that just to agree the Harvard study didn't necessarily address that um, enough but there are other studies that are useful that we can definitely share. Um, so just to keep that in mind. Thank you, Jess. Uh, Bree. 
Hi, thank you. I really focused in on the, the bullet that said there's no increased risk of transmission with transient passing um, with that three feet. So I was, I guess I was looking for some more clarity there. I have first grade dismissal duty every day and it is um, pretty impossible to keep them moving three feet away. So I'm just, I'm wondering, if, I'm wondering if there's any clarity around what's considered transient and what would be considered proximity that we would want to be concerned about. I'm thinking like lockers and again, dismissal arrival for Maine, we're a larger elementary school. So that's an area where even right now with half our kids being in the building, keeping them three feet apart is challenging. So any thoughts on that would be appreciated. Go ahead, go Jess. Oh yeah, sorry, I didn't want to <laughs> jump in too quickly. Um, so it's it's this um, it's 15 minutes of cumulative risk. I'm sorry, 15 minutes of cumulative contact throughout a 24 hour period that ends up being counted. At least that's what the CDC um, definition is. So it has to be 15 minutes. Um, I know that the CDC like that the main DOE responds differently once you have a close contact, like they they require that the whole classroom is quarantined. Um, the school nurses may be more well-versed and if they have a different definition that they use, but for the CDC guideline, it's 15 minutes of cumulative contact within 24 hours. Um, and just to say, I mean, interestingly, and I think I mentioned this last time for in the healthcare setting, it actually needs to be 15 minutes of cumulative contact without a mask before a healthcare provider is considered to be a close contact. Um, and you know, in the healthcare system, obviously you're more likely to encounter COVID patients, but I think it's 15 minutes cumulatively. Thanks. Sonia? Uh, thank you again for your presentation. I think it was very informative. Um, I would like the, uh, the committee to take into, con into consideration for the high school, which is where I teach, and the concerns of uh, possibly considering actually going um, to uh, three feet distancing uh, based on the fact that we do not have cohorts at the high school, that our students go from one class to the other, to another class, and that class you had with you will disperse into a, a lot of different other groups. And that is a concern uh, considering the shuffling, the constant shuffling we have at the high school. Um, so far, I mean, this year we have been able to work remarkably uh, without minimal uh, disruption because of all the different safety measures we are doing. Um, another concern also is the hallway uh, in passing. We're just talking about the, the 15 minutes cumulative. So they are different five, several, there would be several five minutes in between classes. And again, uh, in the hallway, should you have all the students come back, um, never mind even three feet, that would not be happening. So that would be a big concern, but I'm just speaking for the high school. Thank you. Thanks, Tanya. All right, Ingrid, we'll squeeze you in and then we have to go to the nurses for sure. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I just, am, I'm focusing on what the, I saw in the presentation that the main DOE considers an entire classroom, a close contact. And I know that there are a number of schools who are um, bringing students back more uh, right after April vacation. And a uh, concern that I have about that, and I've heard staff talk about as well, is that given that after vacations, there tends to be an increase in cases, that um, if we were to bring our students all back right after a vacation, and then we have a you know, positive case in a classroom, then we have a whole bunch of more students having to quarantine, which impacts families more than if it was just the gold or maroon cohort. So I'm just asking um, that if we were, I have, don't know what timeline the committee might consider, but it would seem to me to make, and to colleagues that I've talked to, to make more sense if we are to start students back, let's say it's, you know, whatever schools, if it's even if it's just the elementary school, um, you know, the earliest, like two weeks after the April break, like May 10th, to give a chance for any kind of community spread to work its way out so that you know, the goal of bringing students back more is to have them getting more in-person education and it takes a lot of burden off families. However, if we end up with a spike after a vacation, that could result in inconveniencing a lot more families and having a lot more students miss out on that additional in-person 
education. So it just seems like that might be a prudent thing to do to consider waiting a couple of weeks, which would be, um, if I did the calculation correctly on the calendar, May 10th. So that may be, I don't know that anyone needs to respond to that, but I'm just putting that out there. Thanks. Thanks. I think the nurses are going to talk a bit about that. And um, we, we have, we have in, in our administrative team thought about that. So yeah, that's a, that's a concern. All Thanks. right, nurses, take it away. All right, so um, I'm going to share my screen or try to anyway, see if I can rid of my... You're on. All right. Are you seeing that okay? Oh, I guess it's loading. Yes, yes. Uh, so I'm Karen Jenkins, the school nurse from the high school, and I have been been tasked to talk about some of the possible risk or adverse impacts uh, by returning to full in-person instruction. Um, so I wanna, I wanna go on record and just say that uh, uh, I don't have any personal agenda to guide these decisions one way or another, that I'm really just trying to provide another, uh, another perspective that will help guide the committee and ultimately the school board in making the best decisions for our students and our community. Uh, so the biggest thing um, that's gonna be impacted is our contact tracing and our quarantine issues, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, it's already been kind of mentioned, but the, the contact tracing in schools is more conservative than as um, typically done from the CDC perspective. So if we're gonna quarantine um, an entire classroom, uh, you know, we're talking much greater numbers. So even if someone's on the opposite side of a classroom, they would still be considered a close contact and be asked to quarantine. Um, there are some more unique situations, larger areas like athletic fields, gymnasiums, um, uh, auditoriums, cafeterias, places that might be dealt on a more um, individualized basis. And in that case, the school nurse would be in touch with the CDC, describe the scenario and um, ask for guidance on how that specific situation would be handled. But for the most part, it's um, an entire classroom. And that's why the cohorting can end up being a big factor in this. Uh, it's also, even if the case is acquired in the community, let's say um, someone went to a hockey tournament, um, was diagnosed with COVID, if that person was ever in the school building during their um, potentially contagious period, then we would have to do contact tracing according to the school guidelines. So there's something called the standard operating procedure, and this is a, the document from the main CDC and the DOE. It's available on the DOE website, um, and there's a link here. Um, and again, it's very clear in terms of how schools need to handle a positive COVID case, um, and we are obligated to follow those guidelines. And this may seem uh, overly cautious from a clinical perspective, but that caution is intentional. And it is one of the reasons that schools have had as low transmissions as they had, or at least um, one factor in there. Oh, oh there we go. Um, so how does this impact um, you know, in increasing our in-person learning. So kind of common math, uh, common sense math is if we're increasing the number of students in our classroom, if we're gonna quarantine a whole classroom, we're gonna increase the number of um, students that are gonna have to quarantine. And in this, um, for instance, in the, uh, in the elementary school, you know, they currently have, or maybe eight to 11 students, and they would be going then up to 16 to one to 21 students that would have to be in quarantine. Uh, the middle school is a much different scenario because they don't have cohorting. So cohorting is when you have the same group of kids in a um, kind of like a bubble or a pod. So the same group of students are together all day. So only those students would have to quarantine. Uh, the middle school, the high school, you know, there's mixing of students um, from one class to another, and that's going to increase your number of contacts. Um, and Jill Young's going to talk a little bit more about that from the middle school perspective. Uh, 
the high school is uh, has really benefited from the mini term model that we have so that they only have um, typically four classes a day. And there is some mixing between those classes. So if you have a student that tests positive and they've been in four classes, then we would uh, have to contact trace all those students and ask them to quarantine for uh, 10 days from their last contact with their student. The other thing that's really helped us out a lot, um, you know, with our current hybrid model is our maroon and gold sort of alternating day schedule. And uh, going back to full in person is going to remove that sort of protective factor. So when we're doing contact tracing, we uh, you look two days back from when the person who tests positive, you look two days back from when either their symptoms developed or when the positive test was um, obtained. So let's say someone wakes up on Friday morning and um, isn't feeling well, they do the prescription screening checklist, decide to stay out of school, and thank you for that. Uh, they get tested and test positive. So that's Friday, but let's say they were a, um, you know, a, um, a cohort that hadn't been in school on Wednesday or Thursday, that they were last in school on Tuesday, then we wouldn't have to do contact tracing in the school setting at all. And we've had multiple situations where we have had positive cases, but we have been able to avoid uh, putting people into quarantine just because of our schedule. So as we have students in more days of the week, we're definitely gonna um, have more people that will be asked to quarantine. Um, I also have, um, I think 250 odd high school students um, that are involved in the athletic programs. I'm not quite sure how that contract contact tracing is going to play out. We're waiting for some guidance on that. Um, but, you know, the extra contacts, both within their team and intermingling with other teams um, and the middle school is also doing some extracurricular activities that that will also add another layer of um, contacts that we'd have to consider. Uh, so, you know, we've, we've heard multiple times that, you know, transmission rates are low. Um, it's important to know that it's not zero, um, that when we put someone in quarantine or we identify them as a close contact, it's because we've said you are at risk of getting COVID. It may be a low risk, but it is a risk all the same. Um, and it's not just a matter of being out of school. These people aren't allowed to go to um, daycare. Uh, if they have jobs, they're not allowed to go to work. Um, they're not allowed to do their uh, school or um, recreational, their club activities, no little league, no family gatherings, travel activities. Things are really on hold for that 10 day period. Um, so yes, we want students back in school more, but um, you know, they also, it comes at the risk of um, having to miss out some other activities and in-person school time if they are having to quarantine more often. Uh, and this can be a stressful time, you know, if, if you have someone that's very academically focused and then all of a sudden they have to miss a week of school, that can be very stressful for them and have some impacts on their mental health. Um, so it's balancing, you know, the many benefits of in-person instruction, but also um, with the risks of um, exposure and potential quarantines. Uh, another thing to consider, and this was sort of touched upon previously, but um, that the risks and benefits that we're, you know, trying to balance out here may also vary depending on age and grade level. So the guidelines are pretty broad. You know, they're the same uh, K through 12, that three foot distancing is safe. And I'll touch upon, you know, with those exceptions of high community transmission. Um, but you know, there is evidence that shows that the rates and transmission uh, look much different in older students than they do in younger students. So, you know, and the guidelines do say, okay, six foot distancing for adults. Um, what about these older students? Uh, there's many that would argue that, you know, the older students, especially the older teenagers, maybe they look a little bit more like the adult um, transmission rates than say the elementary students and might need to be considered a little bit differently. Um, these high schoolers, they're 
fully developed physically, they've got jobs, they're active in the community, they're doing sports, travel teams, um, they're looking at colleges, <laughs> they may be doing other high risk activities um, with or without, you know, protective factors. So, um, you know, these kind of things, you know, make us sort of pause to say, all right, what makes the most sense for high school students is a more cautious approach, um, you know, relevant for these students. And granted, there's many benefits of the in-school, but these are just some other factors to consider. Um, great news about the vaccine. It's very promising. Um, they're gonna start rolling out for 16 and above. Um, we'll be eligible the middle of April. Uh, and that's gonna absolutely help our, um, our scenario for the fall. But just given the timing of getting appointments, waiting for that second dose plus two weeks, I'm not sure that that's gonna have huge impacts for us this spring. Um, so just to touch on the, the risk categories, it's my understanding that the state of Maine is using that um, county designation that's on the DOE site and not specifically the US CDC uh, risk criteria or the CDC's level of community transmission. Uh, the DOE um, is, guided by main CDC data, and they use a variety of different indicators. So my understanding, and certainly something I can research more on, but if we were to uh, go to yellow or red, that um, middle school, high school would be required then to go back to the six foot distancing um, and probably a hybrid model. And that's because we're not able to cohort in those schools. And that's, that's really given, um, those cohorting decisions are because of the specialized instructions that's needed in those schools. Uh, so this just touches upon uh, some of the age differences that um, have been mentioned already. So this top line is the 18 to 24 year olds. Uh, this dotted line here, those are the high school kids, 14 to seven, 17 rather. Um, this dotted line is the middle schoolers. Um, and then elementary is way down here. And that's an interesting study if anyone wants to take a perusal. Uh, this is a brand new site on the US CDC um, website. It's, um, it's kind of interesting. You can click on the different variables. And if you hover your mouse, it actually gives you the, the numbers. But again, the um, 14 to 17 is the solid yellow line. The um, the six to 13 year olds is this dotted line. So the high school kids tend to track much higher um, than the younger kids and may need to be looked at differently in terms of uh, how we wanna do our school planning. The good news absolutely in this graph is how, um, how our cases have dropped. Uh, you know, that January surge was pretty painful for many and uh, fortunately things are better than they were then uh, we have definitely seen an increase in cases recently. And it's important to note that our case counts um, overall are higher than they were when we started school this past fall. Uh, so just uh, some other things to think about. Um, you know, it was already mentioned about April vacation um, and there are many advantages to, to delaying a little bit. There are other schools in uh, the area that are coming back right after break. And again, it'd be nice to allow a little time for some travel quarantine. It would also allow a little more time for um, vaccination, especially with staff. Uh, it is worth thinking about also the impacts on our current 100% remote students. And again, I'm thinking mostly at the high school level that with our current plan, uh, the 100% the remote students access their classes synchronously with Zoom along with the, um, the hybrid students. So it's pretty seamless if they're 100% remote or if they're hybrid. Um, if we were to bring all those hybrid students in, uh, those 100% remote students then, um, you know, are gonna be a handful of students compared to a full classroom. So just in our planning, I think we need to make sure that we do address their, their needs and make sure that there's not, um, some social emotional impacts or disparities um, that are impacting these students. Uh, and I think it's also worth 
um, giving voice to uh, the families that are really in favor of our current model. Um, there's there's certainly been a lot of pressure, you know, locally, globally, nationally to um, get students back to school. Um, but there's also many people who think that, OK, schools have had low transmission. Maybe it's because of all the things we're doing and we should just stay the course um, that um, there's families that like the small class size. They like the extra distancing that like the maroon gold cohorts that they feel that that's the safest option for their family. Um, so if we were to go to full in person, uh, uh, those families, you know, that are tending towards the more cautious side, uh, they might have the option of going fully remote. Maybe not, we're not quite sure yet how that will all play out, um, but they may have some challenges in, in dealing with, um, you know, the only option being the 100% in-person instruction. Uh, so, you know, just to consider with our planning that there are people that um, are not as eager to change. And of course, we're all a little bit concerned about the new variants and uh, possible uh, increase in cases. So, um, here's our contact information. I know we're running short of time, but I'm happy to answer questions at any point, either from the committee or if anyone else ever needs to reach out to me or my colleagues. Um, and if there's anything we can do to support you. Do we have any questions for our nurses? Thank you, Karen. No, actually, I was actually going to follow that. Um, oh, okay, go well. ahead. And share my screen. Oh. I am not permitted to. Oh, there you go. It's Jen. Okay. Um, while while uh, Jill is pulling up, I just wanted to let people know that there are 31 panelists and um, 64 attendees at this point. So, well, Karen or Aaron, can you share the document? It's not allowing me to do so. Donna, can you make me a co-host? I'll try to share it. There you go. Thank you. There we go. Thank you. And then Aaron, I was planning on showing that video as well. So um, if you could have that available, I would appreciate it. Um, all right, so I'm a very much so a visual, well, I should introduce myself first. Jill Young, the nurse at the middle school. And um, I just wanna follow Karen's excellent presentation. Um, for those visual learners out there like myself and um, in the contact tracing process that we follow with the main DOE and main CDC here in our schools. So I randomly selected an eighth grade student to contact trace in both the hybrid model and the 100% in-person um, models. Okay, go ahead. So the, this is the key. The red stick figure is a positive case. The blue is a new exposure or close contact to that positive case. And the blue with the green outline is, uh, was previously identified as a close contact to this case in, another, in an earlier class or somewhere else throughout the day. So that's our key and I'll remind you of that as we move forward. So this is the current hybrid model that we have. We have an eighth grade student that has tested positive. So this is this, and this is a real schedule that I contact traced. So first period, this student has math. There's six students total in the class. We have the one positive case, the red stick figure, and the other classmates, the five other classmates are all considered close contacts based on the DOE guidelines. And so those five are in quarantine based on that first class period. 
Second period language arts. Now we have nine students with three new exposures. Period three is gym, uh, also nine students and two additional exposures. Fourth period is world language, um, seven students total, one new exposure. Fifth period is science, also nine students, and now we have zero new exposures. And sixth period, social studies, nine students, zero new exposures. So to explain a little bit about how the middle school runs. So um, right now we're on a six period schedule. We cohort the best that we can. Um, we can do that a little bit better with the fifth and sixth graders. There's not quite as much movement with those grade levels. As we get into the higher grade levels, there's different math offerings. We have students taking even high school math. We have students in geometry, algebra one, algebra two, grade level math. We have all different math offerings and students are at all different levels. So to keep those offerings available, students have additional exposures that way. Also with world language, um, that increases exposures come eighth grade, the students have the choice to switch their world language. If they were taking French, they can switch to Spanish and vice versa. So that creates some additional exposures based on which world language offering you take. Um, so that's why you see a little bit of crossing there with um, additional exposures coming in throughout different classes. And then that also makes sense why but by the end of the day, um, we're kind of back to some of those cohorted core classes. And then this is lunch. Um, with the first um, case that we had here this school year, um, lunch, like Karen mentioned, our cafeteria, our larger space, spaces are treated on a case-by-case -case basis. We consult with the CDC to see how they would like for us to trace those. With lunch, um, our current setting with a hybrid model, our tables are nine plus feet apart. That was after our first experience of contact tracing. I called the CDC and the CDC said, you know, your students are six feet apart. They're in assigned seats. Your tables are all six feet apart. Um, they're stationary but we can't guarantee that they're always exactly six feet apart in that area. There's some movement happening in there. So we had to contact trace an eight foot radius and it's been that way since. So um, we decided to wise up since we knew that <laughs> information after our first case, we moved our tables further apart. So all of our tables are now nine or more feet apart to limit that close contact. Our students all sit six feet apart. So in this case now, the lunchroom, that positive case, just um, quarantines one individual. Um, and sometimes it might not quarantine any. So we have assigned seats in the lunchroom. I again traced an actual student and um, looked at the cafeteria seating. And this student happens to sit next to someone who they did not have exposure to earlier in the day. So that's an additional contact. So the hybrid model to review it, allied arts are currently on remote days at the middle school. So there's no additional exposure for allied arts. I explained we have six class periods. So the one positive case for this eighth grade student resulted in 12 close contacts of students. I did not include staff because by the time hopefully we would consider any other options, our staff will be fully vaccinated. Fully vaccinated is again, 14 days after their last dose of their vaccine, their COVID-19 vaccine. This contact tracing did not involve the bus. The student does not ride the bus. Um, currently does not participate in any extracurricular activities or athletics here at the school. If they do, that's a much larger impact. Um, close contacts must quarantine for the 10 days or more if symptomatic or should they test positive. Um, quarantine, Karen already mentioned, means no athletics activities, daycare, work, et cetera. Now we'll move into the 100% in-person, same student, um, now we'll start tracing that. So first period math, 22 students, one positive case, so 21 new exposures. Second period language arts, 19 students, 10 new exposures. The blue, solid blue are, are new exposures. Third period is gym, 38 students, nine new exposures. Fourth period, world language of the 22 students, we now have 14 new exposures. 
fifth period science, zero new exposures, and sixth period, zero new exposures, and seventh period. So if we were to bring everyone back in, that means we don't have remote days to offer the allied arts remotely. So we add another period in the day um, for the allied arts. And this student participates in chorus. Chorus is a mixed grade level offering grades seven and eight. So 20 students and a lot of new contacts, 18 new exposures. The student also participates in band, but band was not offered on the day that I traced. So um, just to keep that in mind, there's different days would result in different, but I just picked a day and picked a student and traced it. Okay. Um, so now to fit everyone in the lunch room or lunch spaces, um, we would move our tables closer together again. So tables would be six feet apart and we would trace similarly to how we trace with our first case at the middle school with that positive individual um, forming an eight foot radius around them. Um, three of those individuals were already identified as close contacts elsewhere in other classes, but there's four new exposures. And then that X marks an empty seat on the seating chart there. So the sum it up 100% in person with allied arts and seven class periods. Our one positive case now has 76 close contacts for students. Again, that doesn't account for staff, doesn't account for bus, extracurriculars, athletics, all the same there. So when we're thinking of percentages based on our enrollment, our hybrid model, the student, we quarantine 2.5% of our student body, the 100% in person, the same student quarantined 17% um, a seven times increase. Um, so I thought this was helpful for me to actually go through and trace the student. A lot of times we think, okay, we're doubling our students, we would double our close contacts. So instead of 12, we would have 24, but it's actually quite different. And do I have another slide or was that it? That's it. So um, I also wanted to just mention, I know a lot of this has already been discussed, but our schools are safe. Um, we've worked really, really hard. That of course is our school nurse <laughs> role and responsibility is safety is our number one priority. I think we've done an excellent job. Speaking of excellent job, I have to get give credit to, it's not just the school nurses and my staff is amazing. Our students are amazing. Our families are amazing. And the way that they've shown appreciation um, for the work that we have done as school nurses, but it truly takes a village. It's not just us. It's not just our staff who's done an incredible job. We have to recognize like, while we're talking about getting students in, we also need to recognize we've done an excellent job at uh, making this work. I found the perfect t-shirt for my guy. Sorry. No, that's okay. She's firing up the video, but um, so we need to continue to do that. We need to continue to, you know, it takes a village here. So we've got to continue to support one another to make this work. Um, it's not just the school nurses making this work. We can share the guidelines that the CDC and the main DOE have, and we can educate, but it takes everyone's actions um, and we're relying on that heavily to make this work and keep it safe. So while transmission within our schools is very low, um, when we do have positive cases, it's typically not transmission in our schools. It's coming from outside of our schools. Community transmission is still high and it is very prevalent in our community. So we send a letter out to the community anytime we have a positive case that directly impacts our schools or our school campus. By directly impact, I mean that individual who tested positive was in our school buildings or on our campus during their infectious period. Infectious period is two days prior to symptom onset or if asymptomatic, two days prior to the positive swab. So, that, so we have communicated and been very transparent with that. We have a lot of cases, like Karen said, that do not directly impact our schools, but we have students, we have families, we have staff members who are positive but since it did not, they were not in the buildings during their infectious period, that's not communicated um, regularly. So it is prevalent. So when I say it takes a village, it really does. When we, what we do in school needs to happen outside of school as well. It's hard to see, you know, masks off and um, rallied around, you know, students rallied around a vehicle um, after, right after school, the masks are off and they're all together or our athletic fields without, um, with students, you know, having fun and, um, not taking those same precautions that we take during the school day. So those kind of things are what would result in potentially the need to quarantine. So the case comes into the school and then a lot 
of people are impacted. So I just wanted to follow up with this video. Um, Dr. Walensky um, shared a very heartfelt plea that I would like to share with all of you. This was from last night. And I think it just reminds us all of how to make this work. We all have to do our part. We can skip the ad. Uh-oh. Aaron, if you're Aaron, muted, you're muted. You're mute. Oh, I, yeah. Can we go back to the beginning? And I thought it was just me that couldn't hear it. And for those of you that don't know, Dr. Walensky is the CDC director. Today, we in the United States surpassed 30 million cases of COVID-19. CDC's most recent data show that the seven-day average of new cases is slightly less than 60,000 cases per day. This is a 10% increase compared to the prior seven-day period. Hospitalizations have also increased. The most recent seven-day average, about 4,800 admissions per day, is up from 4,600 admissions per day in the prior seven-day period. And deaths, which typically lag behind cases and hospitalizations, have now started to rise, increasing nearly 3% to a seven-day average of approximately 1,000 deaths per day. When I first started at CDC about two months ago, I made a promise to you. I would tell you the truth even if it was not the news we wanted to hear. Now is one of those times when I have to share the truth and I have to hope and trust you will listen. I'm gonna pause here, I'm gonna lose the script and I'm gonna reflect on the recurring feeling I have of impending doom. We have so much to look forward to, so much promise and potential of where we are and so much reason for hope, but right now I'm scared. Three historic, scientific breakthrough vaccines, and we are rolling them out so very fast. So I'm speaking today not necessarily as your CDC director, or not only as your CDC director, but as a wife, as a mother, as a daughter, to ask you to just please hold on a little while longer. I so badly want to be done. I know you all so badly want to be done. We are just almost there, but not quite yet. Thanks, Aaron and Jill. Sorry, I gotta try to figure out how to get back to my video. Do you want to hear less? Um, so does do any does anybody have any questions for our nurses? I will oh. add just one other thing. Oh, go ahead. Jill. One other thing. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, the, this information can be found on the main CDC website and it's updated, I believe weekly, but it was just updated today that the um, cumulative COVID-19 cases by age, the um, age range in the 20s is the highest right now with 18.2%. And this is since the start. Um, so the 9,158 cases, they currently have the highest number of cases at 18.2% overall. And those under 20 are the second group with 16.3% of the share of cases followed by those in their 50s. So just wanted to share that information. Thanks. Jess? Um, I had a question about the I think tents that were ordered. Um, it's not necessarily for the school nurses, but like for things like lunch and you know band, chorus, anything like that. Can we? Can those things be moved outside to address some of what was just mentioned in terms of the contact tracing? Yeah, so and the only other thing with that CDC data, I yes, I heard that Dr. Shah just presented some of that. But the one thing is the zero to twenty age group is a two decade age group, and everything else gets divided into a single decade. So I think you just have to keep that in mind when you look at the numbers. So yes, we have talked about um, 
moving some of the things outside and what would they be? And it will kind of give our, our classrooms a little breathing room to have those tents. They should be coming um, sometime mid to, mid to end of April. So we do have those, um, those coming. We have, um, before we take more questions and comments, because I know some people have to go, and I do want to say that the administrators have work, been working very hard. You know, we've looked at keeping things the way they are. That's a possibility. We've talked about um, moving students in on Wednesday mornings, and then we've talked about the, the four day a week or the five day a week full return to class. So we're really, um, we're preparing ourselves for all the options so that we can, we can really say, yes, we can do this. But in the end, it's going to be the, the weighing of the, um, the weighing of the risk of doing it and the, the risks and the benefits. So I just want everybody to know that we are working very hard and uh, we've addressed challenges and come up with solutions to challenges. And we're saying at this point, um, yes, we can do that. And this is how we will roll it in. We've been talking about roll, roll ins and different options for roll ins um, the week right after uh, spring break or um, two week, giving people two weeks. So we are ready with a lot of different options and we'll talk about them um, at, at our next meeting next week. But it was really important to look at the risks and benefits. Um, so we can keep that in mind. So that said, um, I know that we're past our time and if people um, want to leave, that's fine. But if there are questions and I wanna give Kate Zellers a chance because I kind of ignored her last time. I don't know if Kate's still with us, but Kate, if you have any questions or comments that I'm gonna give you first, first Chase. Thank you, Donna, I really appreciate that. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you to everyone on the committee. Um, I can tell how seriously everyone is taking it and that there's just a lot of factors to, to consider. Um, so thank you for all your hard work. We, we really appreciate that. Um, I just wanted to speak a little bit about kind of the feelings here at Pond Cove about our return. Um, I've been speaking to my colleagues and I've sent out emails asking for you know, kind of where people are in terms of, you know, kids returning to school. And I was just really amazed and touched at how the vast majority of the concerns of the teachers that I spoke with, so this doesn't represent everyone, but spoken with me, it wasn't really their own health that they were most concerned about. It was um, student health and well-being, student schedules, student impacts, logistics, and things like that. It was, it, it was so representative of how I feel like the teachers in our district, and I'm not at the middle school or the high school, but how I've seen all the teachers in this pandemic really handle everything is that over and over again, we've gone to, we've you know sort of sacrificed our own health, our own sleep, our own time with our families so that we can do what's best for students. Um, and you know, it, it's been really challenging as a teacher to go through this pandemic and as an educator to go through this pandemic because it's kind of like in a year we've gone in some ways from heroes to villains. Like there's this feeling that in the beginning of the pandemic, you know, we were heroes and magicians and we should get million dollar paychecks and people supported us, you know, and how do teachers do it? Um, and educators in general. Um, and then, you know, come the fall, we sort of reinvented the wheel again, moving into this hybrid model. And I've just watched my colleagues here become more and more exhausted by the stress of reinventing education over and over. And we don't have scientific research to show whether what we're doing is going to work or not, or whether it's it's these are best practices in the hybrid model because we've literally invented the hybrid model. And so, um, you know, in the comments from teachers, what I got was almost like a pleading, a pleading to everyone involved, educators, staff, social workers, everyone, like a pleading to just be really thoughtful and careful about how we approach this transition. Um, and also a pleading to the community at large about how you are 
discussing and talking and approaching teachers and posting on social media. Like I have a rule that I don't read comments. Um, but you know, some of, so many of these people that I work with, these amazing, amazing ed educators are coming in every day and they're passing signs, you know, posted in the corners of our district about back to five. And they've gone on social media to look for a new painter and have been accosted by posts about how teachers are preventing the return to school and things like that. And I just, I just plead to everybody out there who's listening and who's involved that um, we are exhausted and we have put up such a good fight to make this happen. And many families are really appreciative. And um, I do get notes and emails from parents like, thank you so much. But just to the community at large and to the administration, thank you for taking the time to let us do this carefully and thoughtfully because so many people in their responses came back and they were like, I'm exhausted and stressed. And the idea of another transition is almost more than I can handle. And then they started to talk about the students. Like they would, that'd be that one line. And then it would be, but you know, my community of students and how am I gonna, you know, it was like just this one line of I'm exhausted and I'm stressed and I'm not sure I can handle anymore. And then there would be a paragraph about, okay, so if we have to do this, what would be the logistics and how do we handle special ed meetings and things like that? So, um, I just think that as educators, we need to just, if, if we are as a district take, taking, making a commitment to the health and well being of our students and staff as one of our long term goals, this is an opportunity to do that. Um, and, you know, whether it's only coming back four days a week and allowing um, time uh, and allowing Wednesdays to continue to give teacher, teachers and educators time to have meetings and plan, whether it's um, having a few days without students or whether it's even accepting that if we come back, at, certainly at the Pond Cove level, there's no guarantee that we're going to make a whole lot of academic progress in the very small amount of time we're going to have. Because at our level, the whole first part of our year is devoted to community building and establishing routines and norms. And we're going to be doing this in a time at the end of the year when most classrooms are starting to celebrate their successes and um, incorporate long-term projects and things like that. We're really going to be starting these classrooms of learners almost over again. Um, so there's just there's just so much to this. Uh, and I hope I've been coherent because I'm taking 80 emails that I got from staff and conversations, excuse me, not, not 80, 57, and then more staff and conversations and trying to combine them into one. Um, so thank you to everyone for your support and your thought into how we approach this transition. And I hope that we can make a decision. And if we do, we can implement the smoothest and easiest transition for, for staff, for students, but then also for our staff who has really just gone above and beyond so many times. Thanks. Thank you, Kate. And thank you to your colleagues who submitted their comments. Questions for our nurses, comments? For anyone? All right. Thank you everyone for your time. Thank you to our presenters today. Lots of amazing information. I know it took a long time to pull all that together, but I think it was um, very informative and gave us some ideas about risks and benefits um, that we can ponder for the next week. Uh, please know that we are, the administrators are continuing to work on options and we'll, we'll get into the, the weeds more about those options next time um, in hopes that we can soon make a recommendation or recommendations um, to the school board on um, April 13th. So have a good rest of your night. Thank you very much. So Jen, did any comments come in? Hi, Heather. <laughs> Hi. I'd say yeah. on, there were a few questions. Yes. Uh, Donna, great job. Oh, that, that was a good one. 
That was a good meeting. Um, yeah, oh, I'm gonna let you go. Can, Jen, you can take off the recording now. Okay. Oh yeah. <laughs>